So with that being said, as you heard, this is my first time speaking here. Um, super excited. We're going to try to get in and learn some stuff together. Um, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about holiness. So before I get into that, I would ask that you would stand with me while I read from God's Word. 1 Peter 1, and I'm actually going to read uh, 13 through 16. It says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming to yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as the he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for a wonderful day. Uh, we thank you so much for all the people you've brought here. We thank you that we're able to have such a wonderful faith family. Um, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from your word today. I pray that you would teach us and guide us and edify us today, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, and we pray that you would lead us and guide us in your word. We love you and we praise you. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So, the goal, I'll go ahead and give you all the goal. The goal behind this message is we're going to look into this command in 1 Peter and we're going to understand some significance behind it. So this is a scripture that I've read tons of times. And it's kind of one of those things you read it and you're like, oh yeah, that's cool. But what does that really mean? What does that entail? And what is the full scope of what Peter is trying to tell us here? So this is a two-part command. In verse 16, Peter says, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So this command entails two things. Before we can be anything, we have to know what we're trying to be. So this command is a, is, a, is a call to know how God is holy and then to be holy as you know God is holy. So we're going to flip it and we're going to start with no. So this verse calls God holy. So what is holiness? I'm going to ask you guys, how would you guys define holiness? Set apart? Walking in his ways. Anything else? When you hear holy, what do you think of? Free from sin. Chris has all the church answers. Jesus. That's what I think of. No. So, I mean, just from those answers right now, we see that this word in English has a religious connotation to it. So the definition of holy in English means to be dedicated to God. So when you hear holy, you think dedicated to God. However, in the scriptures and how this word is used in the Hebrew, it doesn't carry that same connotation. In the Hebrew, this is strong, 6944. It's the word kodesh. It means a sacred place or thing. Um, abstract, consecrated, dedicated, hallowed, holy. Basically, the imagery is it's set apart. It's distinguished. The problem is, that doesn't really tell us much about God. I can tell you that God is set apart, and you're going to be like, cool. What does that mean? That doesn't really tell you anything. So we can say, yeah, God is holy. And that tells nothing about the character of who God is, what he does, how he feels, nothing. So if being holy simply means set apart, it doesn't tell us much about God. How is he set apart and is it in a good way? These are important questions to ask because we're called to be holy how he's holy. So if it just means set apart, that gives us nothing to do, nothing to follow, and no goal. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how God reveals his holiness in Scripture. And there are two ways, obviously there's probably more ways, so don't come at me. But we're going to talk about two big ways and places in Scripture that God reveals his holiness. So the first is in his Torah. In the Torah, God reveals his holiness. So this verse, 1 Peter 1.16, I'll give you a little Bible lesson real quick. Anytime Scripture says, as it is written, it is drawing a cross-reference from something. So this verse actually has like 12 cross-references. You could look at this verse and go back and trace it to almost anywhere. Which is good because that means that we can just get a theme of what he's trying to say. So we're going to go back. We're not going to look at all 12 because I don't want to put you all to sleep. So we're just going to look at three of them. So the first place that we see one of these direct quotes is Leviticus 11.44. So I'm going to read a verse behind, read that verse, and read the next verse. So Leviticus 11.43 says, You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them lest you be defiled for them. For I, the Lord, I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. There it is. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, 
Moving forward, the next one is in Leviticus 19.2. Leviticus 19.1 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and, mother and father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. And then the last one we'll look at is in Leviticus 20, verse 7. So verse 6 says, The person who turns the mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So like I said, there's way more cross-references we could find, but I just wanted to pull up enough so that we could get a common idea. So what all these references have in common is it's either right before or right after a commandment. The reason this is significant is because rules are what set things apart. It's a very popular saying when people are trying to talk about what separates humans from animals, and everybody says rules and order. Or when I think about like public and private schools, like public schools, kids are wearing whatever they want. And in, in private schools, there's always like a uniform or a dress code as part of their rules that are trying to distinguish themselves from public schools. And then we can just see this in several aspects of lives. I mean, just what separates people are rules. It's what sets things apart. It's what makes things holy. So everything God commands reveals something about his character. This is how we see God's holiness displayed in the Torah because he commands things that are revealing insights about himself. For instance, in the, in the Ten Commandments, God says you shouldn't murder. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that God values human life. You know, and God says, honor your father and mother. So that shows us that in God's character, God values the relationship between parent and child. So you can go through every commandment in Scripture and in the Torah, and you can trace it back to his revealing something about God. You learn something about who God is from everything he tells us to do. Because God doesn't tell us things for fun, and he doesn't tell us things just to tell us things. He wants us to live this way because it's how he lives. The Torah and all of his commandments are a direct reflection of him. That's why after he gets done commanding things, he says, now consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. He's basically saying, hey, do this, and do it because that's what I would do, and that's what I did do. That's what he's saying. Moving on, the law is referenced as God's ways several times. Just another way that we can see that everything he commands has a point, and everything he commands will reveal something about who he is. The next thing I want to talk about is the Torah and God's character are inseparable. I know I'm driving this home, but I want us to see some of the significance behind this. So the Torah reveals God's holiness, but when we separate God's character from the Torah, we get an incomplete picture of God. Sin is a personal transgression against God, and when we misunderstand God, it leads us to misunderstand sin as well. When we understand that everything laid out in his law is literally how we live like him or how we live against him, we start understanding some of the significance and some of the weight that the front of this book carries. Today, in the world, you will not find a group of churches that agree on everything that sin is. There is so much debate and stupid it's a tough word to say on stage. Stupid discussions about what sin is. For instance, just to give an example, there are progressive churches that claim that homosexuality is not a sin, even though the word of God does. There are some churches that claim alcohol is a sin, some that claim it's not, some that claim other things are sin, some that claims they're not. So it's like we're all trying to go around and figure out what is sin. If sin is so personal to God, why is there not a hardline definition that we can look to to figure out what it is? However, I believe there is. I believe it's the law. So that's why we can't separate these things, because when we separate the law from God's character, we don't have a complete picture of God, because part, and I say part because the law is very multifaceted, part of why God gave us these commands is so that we can learn through this revelation who he is. He gives us these things so that we can learn who he is and walk more like him, so that we will live better. So next, last thing I'm going to hit on here before we move on, there's a 
beautifully smart man. His name was C.S. Lewis, Charles Staples Lewis. He wrote a book called Mere Christianity that was actually just a like, transliteration of a radio show he did in World War II. So C.S. Lewis is a champion of this argument for God called the moral argument. It is one of my favorite arguments to talk about the existence of a creator. So what C.S. Lewis does is he takes the law of nature and then contradicts it with what he calls the law of human nature. So here's what he means. So everybody has heard of the law of gravity, right? Y'all know what that is? So like if I drop this pin, gravity grabs it and it falls, right? So that is called the law of gravity. So C.S. Lewis looks at that. This is the example he uses. He looks at the law of gravity and shows that the law wasn't put in place before gravity was a thing, right? Gravity was already there. So the law of nature is really just a description of what will happen when you drop the pin. Does that make sense? I had to listen to this like five times to understand it. So if you're not with me, I understand. So we didn't say we're going to make gravity a law and then things started falling. Things were already falling, so we said that's going to happen every single time. So we're going to call that the law of gravity. So the laws of nature are just descriptions of what will happen. So then he contrasts that with what he calls the law of human nature. Because the law of human nature isn't a description. The law of human nature is what man ought to do, not what man does. Man can lie, and everyone knows you shouldn't have done that. So this law of human nature isn't just an observation of things that are happening. So he takes that, and his point is he uses all that information to draw how this law points to God. But don't focus so much on the argument, because the reason I bring all this up is because in his book, he talks about how he thinks this law actually teaches us about who God is. This is what he says on page 29. C.S. Lewis writes, You find out more about God from the moral law than from the universe in general, just as you find out more about a man by listening to his conversation than by looking at a house he has built. So he acknowledges that obviously creation tells us that there is a God, right? So his point is that creation doesn't really tell us anything personal about God, just that there is a God. In the same way, looking at a man's work doesn't tell you anything about the man, just that he's a good worker or a bad worker, you know, however the house was built. But his point is, this moral law teaches you more about God than you could ever get just looking around at the universe because the moral law, which obviously I believe is the Torah, the moral law teaches us who God is. C.S. Lewis was so smart in figuring all this out, and he is a champion of that argument. So if you're ever trying to figure out ways to prove that a God exists, it's a wonderful thing to look into. So the next way God reveals his holiness is in the life of Christ. So we have the Torah, and then we have Jesus coming to earth and living it out. So 1 Timothy 1.8 says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. I threw this verse in here because in Scripture we see it, but we see it today too. It is so easy for us to abuse the law. And this is why it's important to recognize that Jesus is our example of using the law lawfully. We know in Jesus' day there were the Pharisees that basically took the law and twisted it to their own gain and their own agenda, made it say what they wanted to say so that they would seem righteous and be able to condemn other people. So it's so easy to take everything God says and twist it. I mean, we... Guys, we're not better than they are. We can do the same thing, right? So that's why we need to acknowledge that Jesus is our example of the law being used lawfully. So God gives us these commands, and then further than that, he comes and shows us what he meant. He comes and he lives them out. So he says, hey, do this, 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 and this. And then on top of that, because we're stubborn and dumb as humans, he comes to earth and says, all right, now watch me do it. Watch me do what I told you to do a couple thousand years ago. So Jesus comes and he lives out the law perfectly, and we can see it. So John 14.10 says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Christ, on earth, says several times that he came to do the will of the Father. Therefore, his life shows us how God desires us to live out these commandments. And even more than that, we can look at the life of Christ and see how we're supposed to treat everyday interactions. Christ got in religious disputes, political disputes. Uh, he was accused. He was accused of being a liar. He was hated. I mean, 
everything, every disagreement, every dispute you come across today, I guarantee you, you can find something in the Gospels, looking at the life of Christ, that mirrors that, where you can go and you can see how Christ responded, and you can try to mirror that in your life. Instead of tearing someone down in a political debate, go look at what Christ said. Instead of, instead of holding your Bible up and being haughty in a religious conversation, go look at what Christ said, right? Find out how he handles these interactions, because we're going to have a lot of the same interactions. So it's good to realize that we have this blueprint of how we're supposed to be walking because God gives us the law and then he comes and he lives it out so that we can really understand what he's getting at. So then now I'm going to revisit this point. Earlier I talked about how the Torah and God's character are inseparable. And I talked about what happens when you separate God's character from the Torah. So the other side I want to hit on that now that we've seen the life of Christ is When we separate the Torah from God's character, we are left with a set of empty rules that are lacking love, mercy, and justice, also known as the weightier matters of the law. See, the law was never supposed to be used apart from God's mercy and grace and love. It was never supposed to be used apart from God's character. So when it's taken and twisted, it's showing us that they're not using it in conjunction with God. It was never supposed to act on its own. It's not supposed to be an independent thing. It's supposed to work in unity with the grace and the love of God. So only through God can we actually have a righteous set of rules and live a righteous life. The law itself does nothing. And then in the same way, if you try to take away that law, then you get a twisted view of God. You, you, you don't really know what sin is. I mean, you can get pretty close, but as we see, there are so many disputes of people trying to figure out what's wrong and what's right when God laid it out. Don't do this, do that. So, Just to recap all that, we're getting to the good stuff. We're getting to where I want to be here in a minute. So God reveals his holiness in Scripture in multiple ways, but we're focusing on two. God gives us his commandments so that we can see who he is, see his character, and see how he wants us to live, and we can recognize his holiness. After giving us his commandments and seeing how much we suck, he sends Christ, and Christ comes and lives it out perfectly so that we can see what we're supposed to be doing. So now, not only do we have the commandments on paper, we have the commandments lived out. So really, we're running out of excuses. We have everything we need to live a righteous life. Not the point right now. So we can see how God is holy. When we look at those things, we can know how God is holy. Now, obviously, I'm not giving you all the answers here. I'm just telling you where you can go to figure out what the character of God looks like and figure out how he is holy so that you can know how to lead your life. That's my goal. I'm not giving you all the answers. I'm just trying to tell you where to look. So we talked about knowing. The second part of the commandment is being. And this is the fun stuff because this is the challenging stuff. We can talk about the mental stuff all day long, but eventually something has to come into action. So how do we be holy? Super simple. Obedience. Obedience is how we be holy. Our obedience to God is how we imitate his holiness. So going back to our opening scripture, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. We are called to be obedient children of God. It is a, like, Christian motif today. Everybody wants to say, I am a child of God. I see that all over the place, and I love it because it's true. I'm not not hating on that statement. It's very true. We are children of God. But here we can see that 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 statement carries some weight. It carries a call to be obedient. We're called to be obedient children of God. Get some water. Good stuff. So God calls us to be his children, and then after we're his children, he expects us to be obedient. That's, that's what goes along with being known as a child of God. So I was given a message similar to this a couple months ago to some students, and I had to throw in some questions. So I thought about this question, and the reason I'm asking it here is because I think it's a question that we all ask. And if y'all didn't ask this question, then y'all are better than I am, because I asked this question. If we really are saved by grace, we are. That's not the point to focus on. We are saved by grace. If we really are saved by grace, why does it matter to be obedient as a Christian? This is a question I had to ask because, you know, saved by grace, which is absolutely true. So now, why does it matter if I'm obedient? I'm saved. So I thought about this, and this wasn't something I realized until I grew in my faith. And I asked this question because I think we all asked it at one point. But the answer is super simple. Because we love God and because we trust God. That's simple. That's At the end of the day, that's really the only reason to be obedient. That's that's what drives our obedience, because we love God and because we trust God. 
See, it's super simple, and Danny, my friend Danny, is super simple. You ask Danny why he does what he does, and he's going to look at you and say something like, I don't know, God said to do it, so I'm going to do it. That's what he'd say. He'd say, I, I don't know much more than that. I just know if he said it, I'm going to do it. So it made me think about it. It's like, well, why do we care what God says? You know, why does God saying it hold the weight for us to do it? And that has to be fueled by trust. You don't listen to people you don't trust. I mean, just think about it in your life. Would you listen to your parents if you didn't trust them? Would you listen to anyone if you didn't trust them? You'd, you'd probably hear what they said, but you wouldn't listen to it. You wouldn't put your faith in it. So trust has to drive our obedience because God tells us to do things. But if we don't trust them, we don't really care what he says. So then on the other side of that, this might get a little tough. If you're living your life and you don't really care what God says, that might be a sign that you don't love and trust God as much as you think you do. If you see what God says and you just don't care, if it doesn't hold any weight in your life, if you're just like, he said that, but I'm going to do my own thing, that might show a little bit about your heart. Because if we love God and we trust God, we are going to care about what he says. So before we move into obedience, we have a lot more to talk about here. I just want to say this, covering my tracks here. Obedience has nothing to do with our salvation. Obedience has nothing to do with our salvation. As I mentioned earlier, we are called obedient children. We're not called to be obedient until we're children of God. Now, because we're children of God, because we're saved, we're called to be obedient. So rules do not change people. Only God changes people. That's why we're expected to be obedient after we're saved. The Torah defines righteousness and maintains righteousness. What I mean by that is we see righteous living in the Torah, and if we live by it, we're going to maintain our righteousness. But the Torah doesn't make you righteous. God is the one who declares us righteous. Paul is very clear in his writings that by the law, no man shall be justified. The law does not justify you. It helps you see righteousness and helps you maintain righteousness, and you should live by it. But you are saved by grace through faith. Had to get that out of the way because I'm not getting in any trouble, and we're not going to misunderstand that at all because that is the foundation. Christ and salvation is the foundation of everything. If you try to be obedient before you understand that, it's not going to work. So moving on, what I want to do going forward is I want to define what I mean by obedience. I'm going to define this term so that we just make sure we're all on the same page. So in this message, when I say obedience, this is what I mean. I think of obedience as a long-term commitment to live like God and do what he says, both inwardly and outwardly. It is a long-term commitment to live like God and do what he says, both inwardly and outwardly. That's what we're going with. So anytime you see obedience in here, that's the definition. So we're not talking about short-term obedience. We're not talking about following God for a week. Anybody can do anything for a week. It's not hard. We're talking about a lifelong journey of transforming ourselves to try to live like Christ. With me? So first point I want to make about obedience is we do not have the capacity to be obedient within ourselves. Real quick, I'm going to flip to Romans 7. I believe it's right here. Boom. So Romans 7, 15, 15 through 18 says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. So Paul is writing here, and he's saying, I don't understand it. I desire to do one thing, but I'm doing another. My mind desires one thing, but my body is doing another. I'm fighting, and I'm losing. So continuing in verse 16, he's saying, If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present within me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. So the reason I wanted to point this verse out is because Paul writes this years after meeting Christ and being saved and redeemed. So even after he meets Christ, he's struggling with obedience because he cannot do it himself. We don't have this capacity to be obedient within ourselves. So here's the point. Our obedience has to be a result of God's grace within us, not the result of our own strength. Because remember, our goal is long term. You can strength your way out of sin for about a week, maybe two weeks if you're strong, but you're not going to stay there. And remember, the whole point is living this lifelong journey of being obedient. 
It's not, to, it's not to have some short little stint. And on top of that, our goal isn't to live with some sin. Our goal isn't to look obedient but still be struggling with things. Our goal is to live with no sin. So for me, when I got saved, there were some things that were easily knocked. Like my mouth. I cleaned up my mouth pretty good. My daddy cussed like a sailor, and I picked up on it. And then when I was saved and realized I shouldn't be talking like that, that didn't, that didn't take too long. I got that figured out. And with you, there might be different things, but everybody has those things. It's like we were doing things wrong, but we cleaned them up pretty quick. Things we realized we were wrong that we were able to fix. So, I mean, that's good. But there are also things I couldn't fix. There are things I'm still fighting with, things I've fought with for years that I couldn't just fix up. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, hey, I shouldn't cuss. I should talk better. It wasn't a matter of trash in, trash out, clean up my mouth. So with you, there are probably things in your life that while you might have overcome some things, there are probably still some things that you have to take to God every day that you can't get out of. So it's in those things, it's in those moments when we realize we're powerless against this. I can't do that. I've got to take it to God because if I fight it without God, it's going to put me on the ground and keep kicking me while I'm down. So it's in those moments where we have to realize that that's where we need God's strength. And like I said, you've got to remember that definition because you can think you're doing pretty good because you've overcome a lot of things, but there's still those things that dwell in you. So you have to understand that our goal isn't to be a little better. Our goal is to live without sin because the Bible says that Christ has removed our sin from us. Christ came to remove our sin, so we have to go to God to get our sin removed, not some of it, all of it. We have to cleanse ourselves from everything. And the only way we do that is through God. So continuing on this point, we are obedient through the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about how we can't do this in our own strength. Even more than that, God gives us his spirit to allow us to be obedient. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27 is one of the first prophecies, or one of the first prophecies that I know of, of the Holy Spirit. And it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, that's God talking, and cause you to walk in my statutes and carefully obey my rules. So Christ tells us about this helper that's going to come in John. He says, hey, God is sending a helper to help you live in the world. And we see it here in Ezekiel that this spirit, the Holy Spirit, is prophesied. But part of this prophecy is the Holy Spirit literally comes to help us live right. It's to help us live like God. It's to help us follow our rules and get over our fleshly and sinful desires. Because like we saw in Peter, we're called to throw those things out. We're called to not be conformed to the ways of our former ignorance. We're called to be transformed, and part of that is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand Scripture, and it helps us to get our act right, because we can't do it on our own. So speaking of understanding Scripture, becoming obedient is a result of transformation, not effort. And here's what I mean. When I was growing closer to God... When I first got saved, and then a little while later, I really had a zeal for the Word, and I wanted to get into it. And this is what I realized, is if I'm not growing in my knowledge and intimacy of God, I'm not growing in my obedience. So what I mean is, is there were things I overcame. Like I said earlier, my mouth is the best example, because I, I like vividly remember stopping, stopping that and cleaning up the way I talked, because it was a problem for a while. But I would learn things. And I would be obedient at the point I was at. So effort can keep you where you're at, but only knowledge of God will take you further. So what I mean is as you grow further and you learn more about God through pursuing him, then you're going to learn more things that you should be doing and shouldn't be doing. God is going to reveal things to you about your life as you continue to seek him. So if you're not seeking God, you are not going to grow in your obedience. Just how it works. It's like one of those laws of nature I'm not telling you that and then it happens. I'm just telling you that's what's observed, right? If you're not pursuing God, you're not going to grow in obedience. You can stay where you're at and do the things that you've learned, but if you're going to keep getting better, you have to keep growing closer to God. So it takes us to point two. We cannot obey God if we do not know what he commands. If you say you want to live for God, but you neglect to spend time in his word, you are like a dog chasing its tail. You're just running in circles. You're saying things, saying all the right things, and then putting no action behind your statements. If you don't have, I'll just say daily, if you don't have a daily time in your word, or at least most days out of the week, or a consistent time in your scriptures, you're not going to be growing. And if you say 
that you want to grow closer to God, but then you just ignore his word, well, then you're just, you're either lying or you're crazy because you're contradicting yourself. There is no other way. Before you can be holy, you have to know what God commands. And the only way to know God, know the character of God, is to be in Scripture. If you're not in Scripture, you're not going to grow and you're not going to learn just how it is. We absolutely cannot grow closer to God or become more obedient if we do not know his word. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, that you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about Joshua getting ready to take him into the promised land, and he's telling them this. And I just thought about, I wonder how much weight these words had to Israel. Now, not everybody, because I know there was a bunch of rebellious people. I'm talking about the faithful people, the people that were standing there, and they were actually faithful to God. And they realized, like, this code of conduct is dictating my life, and it's dictating my country. So I wonder how eager they were to learn everything that was in the scriptures. And then I wonder, are we that eager? Are, Are we pursuing scripture and trying to learn it like it truly dictates our life? Or are we just learning it like, oh, I'm a Christian, so I should do this? Or are we like, this book determines my character. It determines who I am as a man. It determines my relationship with God. And if I don't know this book, I'm not going to be living the way I should live. Does, that, does the word hold that kind of weight in our lives? And I don't know. I just know it probably held that weight in their lives when they see people dying, when they see you know, people dying for worshiping this calf and people dying from being bit by snakes, and they're like, what do I need to do to not die? I would imagine that they were probably pretty eager to be like, I'm going to go listen to what old preacher man with his scroll has to say. I'm going to go see what he's rolling out and reading to me, and I'm going to try to do it. So we're saved by grace. That's wonderful. But don't ever let that remove the weight of our sin, like our understanding. Sin is a personal transgression of God. God says, you love me. I love you. This is how you should live. And we say, no, I don't want to. I I don't want our grace to ever remove that. Now, I get it. If If you screw up, you're okay. We're saved by grace. I understand that. But it would be a shame If we let our salvation, instead of bolster how we view sin and how strong it is and make us resist it, it would be a shame if our grace resulted in us going, yeah, this stuff's bad, but, you know, I'll be okay. Because that would be really sad. And the last thing I want to say about Scripture is when you read Scripture, you're going to be faced with the same decision thousands of times. Every time you read Scripture and you learn something new, you're going to be faced with a decision. You're going to say, This is how God wants me to live, and this is how I want to live. So I'm either going to apply it, or I'm going to keep going the way I'm going. See, being in Scripture requires sacrifice, because this book is going to contradict our lives a thousand times, maybe more. That's a rough number. We're going to read this, and we're going to say, oh, God said don't lie. But lying has gotten me a lot. So what do I do? So that that decision right there will dictate your position in the Word and with God. Scripture requires sacrifice and humility. Because if you're approaching this book and you're not expecting to change something in your life, you're going to study it like a textbook. But this book isn't meant to be a textbook. This book is meant to cut through our hearts. So when you approach this, you better be humble enough to read how you live and be ready to give it up or be ready to take it to God and get transformed. Because you're not doing this book service If you come to it and you read it and you walk away and go, I might do that one day because that's not what Scripture is for. If we truly understand the weight of the law and the word, how Israel understood it, and we're seeing people dropping like flies, then when we see it and we're faced with that decision, do I want to go my way or his way? We we would go his way, and I hope we would do that today. I hope that our grace and our knowledge of God and our regeneration through the Spirit would take us further into wanting to be obedient and further into understanding the weight and the tragedy of sin than taking us away from it. So moving on, this is the last point I'll hit on. We're going to spend some time here, and then we'll go eat because I'm pretty hungry. But point three, and this one is super, super important, because we've been looking at inward, 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 me and God, me and God, but point three is obedience is our witness to the world. Obedience is how we share the gospel with others. If you want to tell people about Christ, you do it with your works. 
So God is almighty and powerful, but there is a real-time impact of our works. I guarantee you everyone in here knows somebody that says, yeah, I don't go to church because this is a bunch of hypocrites. I don't do that. I don't go to church because that guy who said don't do all these things is doing them. That guy is telling me about Christ, is living like he hates Christ. So just as our bad works can drive a wedge between people and God, our good works can draw people to God. You can make a difference in someone's life, not based on what you say, but based on what you do, how you're living. So our obedience matters not just for us, it matters to the world. Because if you're teaching Christ, but you're not living Christ, then as a pastor friend of mine, Danny Byers, said, you're either crazy or you're a liar. It's one of the two. You're either, you're either crazy or you're a liar. So moving on, Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. So God is talking to Moses and giving him the law, and they're recapping everything. In Deuteronomy 4, Moses says, See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will, sh will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us. Whenever we call upon him, and what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Amen. Let me get a little more water. I'll let y'all sit on that scripture for a second. So the law, along with Israel's obedience, was Israel's witness to the world. And I I think about this passage often because I think about how this dichotomy has absolutely flipped in the world we're in today. So in this ancient culture, rules were a sign of respect and a sign of care and a sign of love. Israel knew that they were loved because God gave them rules to follow. And the world was going to know that Israel was loved because of the rules they had to follow. But then today in our culture, every bit of rules is seen as some sort of bondage or being unfair, when in reality, rules are discipline, and discipline is love. I just think it's crazy how when this was written, that was like the sign of ultimate love and care and respect, is that you're giving someone rules. You care for them enough that you're going you're gonna to help them. You're going to give them guidelines to live by. A good parent gives their children rules. A bad parent lets their children do whatever they want and then watches them grow up. It's tough. I'll say it again. A good parent gives their children rules to live by. A bad parent lets their child do whatever they want, and then they watch it haunt them for the rest of their lives. Because when we're growing up with no discipline, no rules, then we're just doing whatever we want, and we are not learning. So just as Scripture says, God disciplines whom he loves. I just, I just think it's interesting. I wish we would get back to seeing, like, God gives us these things because he loves us. In the same way, our parents gives us rules because they love us. Rules are a sign of love. They're not a sign of oppression or a sign of bondage. I just think it's crazy how it's flipped in our culture. Anyway, to keep going on this, I'm reading this book right now in my Old Testament theology class. It's been a really good book. And he was talking about uh, the, what he calls the Old Covenant and writing about obedience. And this is what he says in his book. He says, finally... By Israel's obedience, they uniquely become a holy nation, mirroring I am, he calls them I am throughout the book, mirroring I am's character by their deeds and thereby sanctifying the world. They are to be holy as he is holy by walking in I am's way. They show the world what I am is like and how the living and only God behaves. So I put that quote in here because he said that better than I could ever say it. I thought that wording was so wonderful. So he goes so far as to acknowledge that the character and Israel's deeds are actually sanctifying the world. So there's, there's just this huge worldly impact to their obedience. And our obedience has that same impact. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Christ says, You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and gives it light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that you may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Once again, our obedience is not just inwardly. Our obedience is how we tell the world about God. So Jesus echoes the same sentiment that our works are our witness. The most efficient way to preach Jesus is you live like him. And I love this super typical quote. It says, preach the word 
And if you have to, use words. And I was thinking about this, is the world hates us, and that's something everybody wants to say, and everybody will look at the world and talk about, oh, Christianity this, Christianity that. The world hates us. But I would ask, what have we done to make the world love us? Now, I know that Scripture says the world will hate us. I'm not, I'm not discounting that. But it's one thing. It's one thing if the world hates us because of Christ. It is another thing if the world hates Christ because of us. Amen. If the world hates Jesus because of us, that means we have failed as a people. We have failed to do what Christ called us to do. We have failed to live how Christ called us to live. I guarantee you that there are so many people in this world that aren't even, aren't even hateful toward Christ. They aren't against being a Christian. They just haven't seen an accurate rep- representation of Christ in their lives. There are so many people that probably are yearning for the freedom that Christ brings that have seen nothing but terrible representations of Christ and nothing but hypocrites that is driving them away. Now, don't get me wrong. There are those people that hate us because of Christ. I'm not saying that's not true, but we can't throw everybody in there because we live so bad sometimes and we're, we, will, we will tell someone about Christ while we're being a hypocrite and then say something like, yep, wipe the dust off your feet and move on. Yeah, oh, they didn't listen. Kick the dust off. Keep going. And I get it. And I'm not saying that scripture is not true. It would be a shame if we used that scripture to justify our bad actions and our lack of effort in getting the gospel to people. I don't ever, I don't ever want to use a scripture like that to justify being bad. I mean, I don't know how to say it. Having bad works, being bad, being a hypocrite, because that's not what that scripture's for. Christ never echoes anything like that. So how many times have we consciously thought about how we were representing God to the lost? So I'll be honest, I'm in a prime position for this right now because the company I work at is... The, the co-workers are pretty rough. I have some pretty rough co-workers. So literally every day I'm with them, now that I'm thinking about these things, I see things like, for instance, I went to New York last week. It was awesome, by the way. I went to New York for work, and we're walking through town, and it's so terrible. It, it, it hurts my heart because every single time a female walked in front of us, my co-workers were like salivating at the mouth like they've never seen a woman before. And I'm sitting there, and I'm... I'm so sad because, one, I probably did the same thing when I was a teenager, right? When I was in high school, I had no respect of women, and I probably did the same thing. I don't know why I just started crying. That's random. Um, He just broke my heart because every one of those women we saw in New York are loved by God, and we're treating them like this. It actually made me sick a lot of times walking through New York when I would hear them say something about a lady that they thought looked good. And so I was, I say all that to say I was, I was literally cognizant of it and I was looking up everywhere we went because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a part of it. And a couple times I had them look at me and say, why don't you look? I was like, I have a girlfriend and I love her and I don't want to look at other people. And they thought it was weird, whatever, but it's planting seeds. It just makes me sad. I don't know why I'm crying like this. <laughs> oh, man. It just broke my heart. And then a girl would walk by that they didn't think looked good, and it was just insult after insult. I'm like, man, these are people. And one of them has a daughter. And I was just thinking, what would you think if people looked at your daughter like this? If someone looked at your daughter and called her mean words and said she was ugly or said that they wanted to do all these things to her? Just, it was just make It, it was terrible. <laughs> I was, I was there for a week, so eventually it was just like, I was, I was glad when I was home, because as much as we need to go out and be around people and be a witness, it is taxing, and it, it does take a toll. But I say all that to say, are we being cognizant of how we are representing God to people? Are we being mindful of the things we're doing in front of other people? Are we living just like them and then try to bring Christ up in a conversation? Because I guarantee you, They were going to sit there, and they're going to think, that doesn't make sense, because just a second ago, you were cutting up with me. You were acting stupid with me. You were talking just like me. You were looking at the same things I was looking at. And now you want to tell me about Christ. Are our actions the driving force in our evangelism, or are we just using empty words? What are we using to share the gospel with people? Are we using Scripture to justify being away from broken people? This is another struggle I have, guys. I have a brother 
who is as lost as lost gets. My brother is struggling. He has made bad decision after bad decision. And quite frankly, it is hard for me to be around him because he's constantly doing stupid things. I've never caught on stage. It's just crazy. But it breaks my heart because it's so hard for me to be around him. But I know, I know that if I'm around him, I can represent Jesus in a way that could help him. And it's a struggle. It's so hard because my flesh wants to use scripture like that to say, I don't need to be around you because you're doing bad things. And you don't care about the gospel and you don't care what I have to say. So I'm just going to ignore you. And that's the hard part. It's not easy being in the world, guys. I get that. But we have to do it. It is a necessary evil. But I just, I just want us to be cognizant of our actions. How are we reflecting the gospel and how we live? When people meet us, do they think higher of Christ or lower of Christ? How do we affect how people see him? Be conscious of that. So in summary, I'm almost done. In conclusion, this command from Peter means more than we think. This command is a command to go on a lifelong journey of pursuing God. We are called to know Him and recognize how He is holy. We are also called to obey Him and imitate His holiness. This command is a command to pursue God and obey His commands. Guys, I hope that we pursue God like it matters. I hope that we don't let our grace be an excuse to be stagnant in our actions. I hope that we pursue God and pursue his word, not just for us, but for the world. Because the world's not going to get closer to Christ if his people don't represent him well. Uh, With that, I love you guys, and thank you for listening.